Thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. I must say it's always a little intimidating to have one's words quoted back to you uh, after the fact. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that I'm learning in this position is that there's much greater requirement to be scripted than is uh, normally the case. Uh, uh, as you may know, uh, a lieutenant governor has to be totally apolitical, has to be non-policy prescriptive, and for a long time policy wonk, that's a particular challenge for me as I, uh, I, I do have views on a number of things. So if you'll, uh, uh, if you'll pardon me for being somewhat careful with my scripted words, that's the reason why, but I look forward to engaging in the conversation and of course to also hearing from the real experts uh, around the table. I've had the good fortune to spend a lifetime of being the non-expert, the generalist in the room, uh, and uh, so I look forward to the views of, uh, of those who know a lot about uh, the subject matter at hand. May I just take a moment to uh, acknowledge uh, where we are as a sacred gathering place for the many indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, to recognize the long history of First Nations and Métis people in Ontario, and particularly today to the Mississaugas of the New Credit. You know, this nexus of uh, environmental and energy security is, of course, a daily conversation in this country, in this province, and in this world. We can't pick up a newspaper or listen to a radio or television story without finding a story about climate change, carbon capture and storage, the potential of the pros and cons of nuclear energy, and of course the evolving story of the technological developments in renewable energy. And I imagine that's the same the world over because any analysis that we do of the current state of geopolitics and economic development c reveals, I think, a pervasive sense of insecurity about future energy supply and global climate disruption. How to meet our ever-increasing energy needs and wants in a socially and environmentally responsible way is one of the most vexing conundrums that face us all. Coincident with the growing energy demand, climate change is, of course, folking, uh, causing us to face the inevitability of a carbon-constrained world. And just before I came, I, I noted a, um, a comment by Christiana Figueres, who, uh, who, of course, led the climate change uh, negotiations and the, uh, the conference in Paris. And she said, that we actually have two options. One is to continue with 20th century high carbon technology and solutions that exacerbate the problem, offer little or no resilience to the impacts that are already locked into the climate system, or we pay tribute to the developments and benefits that we've received from fossil fuels, but recognize that those technologies no longer fit the purpose and we put our efforts then into de developing the necessary low carbon technology and resilient infrastructure. In other words, we tackle climate change not as an end in itself, but as a means to a resilient society, to sustainable development, and to more fulfilling and enriching livelihoods and lifestyles. And I mention that particularly because it's a different perspective on, uh, on why we focus on this issue and the issue that you're interested in today is, in fact, about framing things, about looking at other alternative perspectives in dealing with the uh, public and our, and our citizens. The second reason for my interest in this conversation is that I actually believe that sound science and amazing technologies will continue to, bit, to be developed, and we will continue to harness them. But that's not where our major challenges lie. I am convinced that we continue to be bedeviled by our efforts to understand and affect attitudinal and behavioral change. 
and not only of individuals but also of institutions. And that's something that I don't think we pay nearly em enough attention to. So I think by framing this afternoon's conversation in the way you have, uh, you too have a sense uh, that it's crucial to actually convene in genuine dialogue. I think it's also appropriate that this discussion does take place here in Ontario because there have been visions proposed for the future about prosperity and sustainability. And I think we all recognize that answering tough questions about not only how to build, but where to build, what to build, who should be doing the building, is really not for the faint of heart. So I very much congratulate you and, uh, and the Ivy School for their foresight in convening this uh, discussion. I also want to make uh, one, other, uh, one other point about my interest in the conversation, and that is that one of the things a Lieutenant Governor has the opportunity to do is to shine a light on important issues in a way that transcends politics and transcends time. And after listening to Ontarians for the last two years all over this province, there are two themes that, uh, that are of particular interest to me. Uh, one, of course, is sustainability. Uh, a word that I wish there were another word I could use because it carries a lot of baggage and is ill understood. Uh, it's never something I can explain in a 30-second soundbite. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is how you do connect the dots between economic prosperity and particularly innovation, environmental stewardship, and social cohesion. And it's that latter part that often gets left behind. And it's that latter part that often ends up being the real problem when you're trying to implement development projects uh, to bring about economic prosperity. The second theme is not unrelated, and that's Ontario in the world. I say in the world, because I do <coughs> profoundly believe that we are so fortunate. We are so rich in every respect, rich in our natural resources, rich in our intellectual resources. Uh, we are fortunate that we have a relatively stable system of governance in this province in this country, and we have much to contribute to the rest of the world. Furthermore, if we don't do so, if we only look inward uh, and don't understand the rest of the world, how to live in it, work in it, and trade in it, uh, we're likely to get left behind in an interdependent and complex world. So those two themes, which I've come to believe resonate with what Ontarians are telling me, about their concerns and their aspirations and their pride in their communities are, of course, very relevant to the conversation we have today. Sustainability underpins the questions that we're asking, and a great many of us across this province want to see Ontario advance as a producer of renewable energy. With respect to Ontario's position in the world, we want to see our province as a leader we have so much to offer, as I said, in terms of our expertise and our diversity, and also much to learn as we move ahead. It's very easily easy to be paralyzed by the immensity of the energy challenge. There are positive signs, however, that Ontario and other jurisdictions are in fact acting. Here we no longer use coal in the production of energy. We're emerging. Uh, we're joining an emerging North American carbon market. Uh, we have uh, a h very high installed capacity for wind energy in absolute terms. And internationally as well, there are some very positive statistics. Um, you would know those better than I, but the point I'd like to make is that while we know statistics can be quite motivational, we know they're also inherently abstract. It's the underlying stories that one can tell that point to the real challenges in implementing and creating responses to those challenges that are really providing the useful lessons. Um, now, I'm sh I haven't met him yet, but I think his worship is here from Haldeman County. There you are. Thank you. I was going to say that I'm sure you could point to the fact that um, in 2015, Ontario derived 30% of its power from renewable sources.
thanks to developments such as the turbines in your county. But I suspect that you would and maybe will tell us that wind energy developments and other renewable energy projects aren't built and sustained without costs. And of course, even those outside the jurisdiction weigh in on the decision making, uh, whether it's uh, the old, uh, rather old term now of NIMBY, uh, not in my backyard, or a new one which I hadn't heard, bananaism, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone, uh, <laughs> take center stage. That was a new one for me. So how we can re reconcile the very real province-wide and planet-wide need for green energy and sustainability with the concerns of those we're asking to host and live with these projects is not an easy issue to resolve uh, to anyone's satisfaction. So while I can't prescribe any path ahead, uh, perhaps I can contribute just a few reflections from a real life story. And that was the story about what approach Canada might take uh, to dealing with the care and management of used nuclear fuel. Mentioning the word nuclear often inspires fear and anxiety. It polarizes citizens. And as you so kindly suggested, NWMO assumed that it was incumbent upon decision makers to actually understand the terms and conditions that would make any approach acceptable to society and then to respect those factors in design and implementation. During our study, we were often asked, why is it necessary to involve non-experts, ordinary people? Why should we consider ethical and social aspects? Surely what we want is simply the best technical response. Well, there are several answers to that question, of course, but in its simplest form, the answer is that the public has a right to be engaged in discussion about matters that affect their lives fundamentally. Central to the issue of waste management, of course, is the question of risk. And while scientists and specialists can articulate both the nature of risk and ways in which that risk might be mitigated, it's really society that will ultimately decide what risks they are prepared to accept. So understanding the values and the deeply held beliefs of people matter a great deal. Furthermore, as several authors have noted in recent years, what qualifies as intellectual authority in contemporary societies, who and what to believe, is actually changing fundamentally. People today are much less, prefer, much less prepared to defer to experts. Some call it the wisdom of crowds, some call it the decline of deference. This is a relatively new paradigm shaped by information and technology, uh, communications technology, by globalization, by post-industrial affluence, and by a culture which I think as never before celebrates and empowers the individual. So engaging citizens is not just a matter of rights. It's actually about making better decisions. People who are affected by policies bring special insights and on-the-ground knowledge to the table. And astute decision makers in both public and private sectors are very wise to recognize this at the start. And that's certainly what we've learned from dealing with any projects that are developed on indigenous lands, just as one example. Just as importantly, policies and decisions that are developed in an environment of trust and confidence are much more likely to draw public consensus. People who feel integral to a process will be motivated to help sustain its outcome. And certainly one of the things that we learned was that people did not expect that their views would always be uh, accepted. They wanted to be heard. And as, a, as an organization focused on integrity and operating with integrity, being able to show people that you listened to them and what you did with their information 
goes a long way to building acceptability of the end result. At NWMO, an ethical framework also made us, on that issue, profoundly aware of the time dimension. You know, we were asked to propose a system to meet rigorous standards of safety and security for periods longer than recorded history. And that's just a little intimidating. No other public policy initiative has ever been challenged to perform over those kind of time frames. We don't know what technologies will be available to future generations, nor do we know what changes there will be in institutions, values, political perspectives, or financial circumstances. But we knew that we did have a responsibility to deal with the problems that we've created today and a duty to leave a sound legacy for future generations. But the fact is that there are no right answers to many ethic ethical questions. The bottom line is that trade-offs among competing objectives are going to be inevitable. And in a democratic society, the inclusiveness and the integrity of the process by which decisions are taken is going to be the key to success. Only a process that considers diverse views and seeks out multiple perspectives in genuine and I stress genuine, and transparent dialogue will be considered trustworthy of protecting the public interest. And that was one of the key features, rightly or wrongly, about the nuclear industry. They had not built up trust and confidence over the years of their experience. They had assumed that nuclear was too difficult for the ordinary person to understand and consequently, they were the experts, and only they knew the answers, and there was no need to talk to anybody else about the issues. S these kind of issues of technology, I think, demand engagement, not just one-way consultation. And certainly, during my time at NWMO, we did not use the word consultation, and that was very deliberate. It's a word like sustainability, in that it has a lot of baggage. People assume consultation is passing out information uh, and uh, engagement, on the other hand, implies a two-way dialogue and conversation. So I leave you with two uh, final considerations. Uh, the first one is really about stories. How do energy developments affect the, lo the way local communities see themselves? in relationship to their history and their relationship to the rest of the province. And I say that because place actually matters. The places where we live anchor us in a rapidly changing world, and they shape the stories that we tell about ourselves, about our families, and our communities. Development projects can shepherd positive changes to these stories, bringing narratives about increased prosperity, championing the environment, reversing the trends of, or reversing the effects of pollution on a beloved landscape, or they can bring about a sense of loss, loss of a way of life, of work that's brought prosperity to families and regions, of ecosystems that constitute the very environment that we're looking to save, and no one really wants his or her story to change for the worse or to be erased. So listening to those stories, uncovering those stories, is absolutely essential, I think, to those who advocate new energy projects and new developments. You'll have a much better sense of what's actually at stake in the changes that are being proposed. And the second comment I'd make has to do with the concept of disruption. I think this term is a very useful one because it forces us to recognize that there are competing narratives. There's the narrative of the disruptor and the narrative of the people whose lives are being disrupted, and it pits their stories one against the other. How do we reconcile local disruption with the potential developments of a new development on a larger level, whether it's regional or provincial? 
how much should local residents be prepared to sacrifice? Can that sacrifice be mitigated or compensated? And the point that I want to make is that at stake here is not only our environment, but perhaps even more critically, what's at stake is social cohesion. And that's absolutely essential to who we are as a community, as a province, and as a country. The just and sustainable society that we seek to build in Ontario depends on our being able to use the pronoun we instead of us and them. Too often it seems the debate surrounding renewable development projects divides people into two camps with name calling on both sides. So this conversation about energy development demands the best of our creativity and will to design a participatory process in which people feel as if they have a stake and ultimately ownership in the decision. How do we accommodate our own wishes and beliefs while recognizing that the decisions we make now will affect, will affect the, the uh, generations, uh, lives of generations to come? Science and technology, with their ever greater capacity to recreate nature, really are forcing us to confront moral dilemmas that I think require much deeper dialogue both here at home and around the world. Because ultimately, science and technology, as wonderful as they are, tell us what we can do, but it's ethics that tells us what we must. I like to speak about the idea of a contract between science and society. It's not a new idea. It actually stretches back to at least the time of Sir Francis Bacon. Back in 1620, he urged his fellow scientists to, and I quote, seek the true ends of knowledge, not for the pleasure of the mind or for superior to superiority to others or for profit or fame or power, but for the benefit and use of life and that they perfect and govern it in charity. Today, that contract that Sir Francis suggested I think can really link research to policy and action. It can reconcile scientific progress with social relevance, and it can allow us to benefit from technologies while managing their inherent risks and respecting, respecting the values of our citizens. Design for the new real world, whatever it may be, will inevitably harness science and technological innovation but equally, I hope it will cause us to demand the very best of our efforts in citizen engagement and reflect in a meaningful way the stories that local communities want to tell about their place in this wonderful province. Thank you again for allowing me to be part of this dialogue. I look forward to a most productive uh, discussion. Thank you. Merci. Miigwech.